If you've ever read Paul's letters to the church at Corinth, you know he wrote to correct sinful practices in the church. Now this is something the world focuses in on at times. Uh, I have heard, and perhaps you have as well, I, I have my own, uh, I would do my own worship uh, in my bass boat or uh, hiking in the mountains or whatever the case might be. I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites and sinful people. Well, that's where you need to be, Mr. Sinful Person, with the rest of us washed by the blood of Christ, struggling to walk with him day to day. People look at us in ignorance and they expect perfection. Is there anyone here that qualifies? Well, kind of, huh? We are perfect by faith in Christ. We have had his righteousness imputed to us, but our thoughts and the practices uh, on, in day-to-day -day life are still tainted by what remains of original sin within us. He writes to the Corinthian church to address some problems. First of all, the church members were suing one another, even though it is forbidden in the scriptures for a Christian to sue a Christian. There were issues concerning the practice of Christian liberty. Remember, they were uh, arguing about whether you could eat meat sacrificed to idols or um, uh, the dietary restrictions that God put on the Jews, were they still applicable to uh, the Christian under Christ? There were disputes uh, among the strong and weak Christians on many counts, not just food. In addition to this, women were taking up leadership positions in the church and the men were allowing it to happen. Paul deals with this by reminding them of God's system of authority and subordination, which system must be submitted to for the sake of peace and prosperity of both church and home. God, Christ, man, woman, that is the chain of command. Later, in the, book of, uh, in the book, Paul spends a great deal of time talking about the abuse of spiritual gifts. They had focused on the gift of languages and of healing and of prophecy, and they weren't paying attention to the heart of the gospel as they should. They weren't being used correctly, even though they did exist. And for our purposes today, the Lord's Supper was not being celebrated in an acceptable way. This sacred celebration of the redemptive work of Christ had become commonplace and a source of dispute and prejudice. Instead of a form of worship, it had become a source of sin. I am reminded of the casual way uh, that people observe or think of the Lord's Supper um, uh, something that happened about maybe two years ago, a lady erupted during uh, the communion service and said, I don't know why you give us this little piece of bread. It's not enough to fill us up at all. I said, thank you. What else? <laughs> what else could you say? And then I explained the, the symbolism as I try to do all the time and, and so on and so forth. But she was an example of people who are oblivious to why religious things are done. It's not everybody, but there are some and we need to be reminded of the why and the proper nature of our observing the things that we've been, been commanded to do. Taking religion, our faith, uh, and our practice for granted is always a danger. Uh, our faith sometimes becomes routine and habitual, and there isn't any meaning to it uh, as concerns us. We find ourselves just going through the motions, repeating words that once meant something, but now are just religious noise. Uh, it also comes to mind uh, that in the middle of uh, a pastor's sermon, some lady hopped up to announce a yard sale. And I was there to witness this. 
Where was she? She wasn't in church. Her mind was a whirl with the things of, of uh, earthly things and, and she had no concept of what was being done and stood up and interrupted the preaching of God's word. We must never allow ourselves to be so callous about our worship. We must never find ourselves going through the motions, repeating words that once meant something but are now just religious noise. Our corporate confession, for instance. Church attendance can become an empty ritual if one is not careful to worship God in spirit and truth. I had a lady say to me once, I don't go to Sunday school anymore because I've already been taught that stuff. I know it all. Well, good for you. I don't. I need to keep studying the scriptures. Reciting the corporate confession or our responsive reading of scripture can come to mean very little if we do not focus on what is being said. Sometimes Christians get so familiar with the Lord's Supper that it means very little to them. Parents begin to allow children who show no signs of conversion to eat and drink as if they were Christians. Unbelievers and Christians who are clinging to God dishonoring sin often eat and drink as if their rebellion went no meant nothing to God. As the Apostle Paul corrects these Corinthians, he warns and corrects us. Speaking of the Lord's Supper, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 17. I do not praise you because you come together, that is to celebrate the Lord's Supper, not for the better, but for the worse. Can you imagine that? Eating and drinking the Lord's Supper in a, in a manner that would make it sinful instead of a blessing? Not for the better, but for the, for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may become evident among you. And so that, that is a truth. There is always that in a congregation and that in the character and behavior of individuals that identifies those who are actually following the Lord Jesus and those who aren't. But that's not what he's talking about. Verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper as you say it is. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry or left out, and another is drunk. Now, we pass out grape juice, but they used wine and they passed it around in large cups. Uh, it was a common meal. Uh, and so there was the uh, opportunity for uh, gluttony and for drinking all the way to drunkenness. So how did some people go hungry? Well, the rich would show up early and devour the food before the poor arrived. Or maybe they required the, the poor to wait till the, church had, the rich had satisfied themselves and they could have the leftovers. We don't know, but the point is there was a division in the church. The, those who were well off had a new attitude toward those who were not as blessed uh, in material things as they were. I can see them sitting in the back of the church, perhaps. We don't know the whole story. What we do know is that there was a division. They were not loving the poor brothers and sisters as commanded throughout the scripture. And then in 1 Corinthians 11:23, Paul reminds us of what the supper is about. He says, I received these instructions from the Lord. And so it's kind of a heads up, pay attention, God's talking here. I received them from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you. And so he's explained this to them before, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to his disciples, this is or represents my body, which is about to be sacrificed for you. For those of you who have been here, you know that the statements in italics and in parentheses are my explanatory statements. That is not part of the actual text. He goes on. Do this in remembrance of, 
of me. This is my body, which is about to be sacrificed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this to remember that I gave my life to save you from your sins. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is or points to the new covenant ratified by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, as I've pointed out many times in the past, the bread is not, nor does it turn into the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, Rather, it reminds us of Christ's body that was given for us. As I just indicated, uh, the cup reminds us uh, that the old covenant has been fulfilled in Christ and a new covenant has taken its place. The old covenant said, keep my laws and live. Have any of you succeeded in that? Keeping the Ten Commandments perfectly so that you can go to heaven apart from faith in Christ? The perfect one in our place? Of course you haven't. The Old Covenant said, keep my laws and live, which only proved our inability to do so. The New Covenant says, I sent my son to keep the law in your place, and by faith in him your sins will be forgiven. Hallelujah. So let's look at the contents of some chapters in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, it's toward the end of your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, just after Philemon, which is equally difficult to find sometimes. But Hebrews 9 and 25. Chapter 9 and beginning... With verse 24, actually. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. Now, let me pause there. There were holy places made with hands. In the wilderness, uh, when the Jews wandered for 40 years, uh, there was a tabernacle. This was a holy place. There was a place where the priest did his work. There was a holy place where uh, some of the ordinary priests could uh, carry on their work. And there there was the most holy, which represented the presence of God. And he was the only one that could go in there and only once a year. But Christ wasn't concerned with the movable tabernacle of the Old Testament or with the stone temple in his day. No, Christ did not enter into a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. The priest uh, went through all kinds of ceremony and brought blood and sprinkled it on altars. Jesus, the Lamb of God, sacrificed himself for our sin and went directly into the presence of God and said, I have redeemed those you gave me to save. My blood, my wounds, I was buried, I rose from the dead, and I represent all of these people. Verse 25. Nor was it that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood not his own. Otherwise, Jesus would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. I was raised in a place where uh, you were taught uh, you were saved by faith, but you had to keep your salvation by keeping God's law, by behaving yourself, by never crossing the line into sin. And if you did, you needed to be saved all over again. And the scripture says, if that's true, Jesus would have had to have been crucified again and again and again. But in fact, he offered his salvation one time for the salvation of all who come to him by faith. Not the repeated sacrifices of the Old Testament. They all pointed to the one and effective sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, verse 26. Otherwise, Jesus would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, Jesus has been uh, manifested or came to earth to put away sin forever by the sacrifice of himself. 
not for a thousand years or 10,000 years, but forever, the sins of sinners who have cast their faith and, and lot in with Jesus have come to believe that he is their righteousness, their sins are forgiven forever. Outstanding. Hebrews 10, 5. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5 says this, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, he is speaking to God, sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired. What? God commanded sacrifice. Millions of bulls and sheep and doves and, and uh, all kinds of, of uh, uh, farm animals were sacrificed by the instructions of God. But Jesus says... That wasn't the thing that was important. Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired. It all pointed to a body that you prepared for me, the true lamb slain for sinners, in whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou took no pleasure. Sins were not satisfied. Sins were not forgiven. They were not put away by the sacrifice of beasts. God's wrath toward sinners was not turned away by the animal sacrifices commanded in the Old Testament. These were only shadows of the sacrifice that would finally propitiate or extinguish and satisfy the wrath of God toward us for sin. Verse 7, Hebrews 10 and verse 7, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the role of a book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. You know what he's talking about? The Old Testament. Remember when he told the, the two uh, travelers on the road to Emmaus that the entire Old Testament is about me? That's what he's saying here. Behold, I have come in the role of the book, in the prophets, in the Old Testament. It's all about me. And I have come to do thy will, O God. Verse 8, after saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do thy will. He takes away the first, that is the old covenant of keep my law perfectly and live in order to establish the second, a new covenant by which the sins of God's people are permanently forgiven. By this will, uh, we have been sanctified or set apart from God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Through the body, the offering of the body of Christ once for all. In other words, Jesus dissolved the insufficient symbolic human priesthood to establish his own. The human priesthood was only a shadow of the real thing to come. Now that the real high priest has arrived, there is no human priesthood. As our high priest, Jesus, went into the very presence of God to offer his own body and his own blood for our sins. Therefore, by the will of God, verse 10, we have been set apart from the world. We've been sanctified made holy in the eyes of God, not by baptism or participating in the Lord's Supper, not by our doing our best to keep the Ten Commandments, but through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Isn't that amazing? Steve, you've been perfected by faith in Christ. That's hard for us to understand. If I were to tell you that I am perfect in Christ, you would say, yeah, I know about your perfection. Yeah. This is what Jesus did for it with one sacrifice for sin. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, those who are set apart for salvation, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. These have been made perfect for all time. And verse 15, the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. Now here's the new covenant. I will put my laws upon their heart. And upon their mind, I will write them. Has there been a change in you? 
Do you now understand your sin, the righteousness that God demands, the fact that you can't provide it? Have you fled to Christ and asked him to save your never dying soul? Have you confessed your sin to him? Are you ever conscious since you came to faith in Christ? Does the spirit bring to mind no, don't do that, don't say that, bite your tongue, get your hands off that. And does it also say, this is what you need to do, yes, you need to interrupt your day to take care of this man's problem or this woman's problem or child's problem. I brought this assignment to you, just chill out and do it. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their mind. I will write them. And then he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. I will remember no more. Part of my past comes to my mind every week. Pieces here and there, I despise it. I don't like it, but one thing it does, as Mr. Bauckham said, I shared with you this morning, when my sin comes to mind, I worship my Savior. It reminds me of the grace that's been extended to me and the marvel of his redeeming love. Their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. The proof that the Old Testament sacrifices never put away sin is the fact that they were offered perpetually and year after year and month after month and, and uh, 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 festivity after festivity. It never stopped. And the Hebrews also tells us in another place that the sacrifices were just to remind you that you're a sinner and you need a permanent relationship with God. And it only comes by faith. The work of our redemption, folks, was finished. It was made complete when Jesus died and rose again for our justification. And when his work was done, he sat down. There were no chairs in the temple, the stone one or the... the uh, a tent of meeting in the Old Testament because the priest's work was never, ever finished. He had to keep offering one sacrifice of another, after another. But when Jesus gave his life for us, was buried, rose from the dead, he went and sat down next to his father, having accomplished everything the father had told him to do. Go and redeem those I have given you. By one offering, beloved, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He speaks, as you know, of the, those chosen in eternity past and set apart for, for salvation by faith in Christ. Jesus came to save people given to him by the Father. And that is exactly what he did. And his work is done. They're all swimming around out there like a... Like a uh, a school of stubborn bass and you throw worms and lures and, and everything at them and they don't bite. But some of them are the children of God. Keep preaching the gospel to them. The crowds around us, the people who at the moment hate God and are screaming blasphemous things in our streets. We are fishers of men. They're going about their business and the lure that will save the people of God is to tell them the truth about themselves and our Savior. That is the message that saves sinners. It's the power of God for salvation. We got to keep it up. Now look back at verse 27 or look at verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner and inappropriate manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So what does this mean? Who is worthy of celebrating the Lord's Supper? Now, those who refuse to trust Christ for forgiveness of sins shouldn't come to the table. This is a Christian thing. 
This is for the children of God by faith in Jesus. An unbeliever is not to be baptized, neither is he allowed to eat and drink the Lord's Supper, for him to do so would to be declare his un- to declare his union with and dependence on Christ for salvation, which presently is not true. Therefore, the unconverted, those who have not cried out to Christ for reconciliation to God by forgiveness of sins, uh, shouldn't participate in the Lord's Supper. Because, and you'll see that as we go along. It's a, a testimony of faith in Christ. If indeed you have come to faith in Christ, then you are invited to the table. There are times when a Christian is not in the right spiritual condition to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Have you ever experienced that yourself? When you, with your conscience will not allow you to take that cup and that bread and, and drink and eat. The sins that made the Corinthians unworthy of participation were many. They were ignoring the instructions of Jesus delivered to them through Paul for a proper celebration of the supper. They refused to treat their poor brothers and sisters as equals in the eyes of God and simply put, nothing about the supper as they celebrated it was acceptable to God. It wasn't a holy moment in any way. Therefore, the Apostle Paul cautions his readers and us saying, let a man examine himself. We're told in our society that we're fine like we are. That if my opinion contradicts yours, then mine's just as good as yours. And if it contradicts the Bible, that's an archaic book. Anyway, it doesn't have any application to our modern society. But Paul says, let a man examine himself by the scriptures And only then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What is the examination? Am I living and behaving and speaking like a Christian? Am I loving uh, God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, the best of my ability, and my neighbor as myself? Or do I have a handful of sin of some sort, such as despising the poor and eating all the food so they can't have anything? Do I come to the Lord's Supper looking out the corner of my eye to that knot-headed woman or that stupid man over there that offended me a couple weeks ago? I can't stand him, so I'm sitting over here and I got the cup and the bread in my hand saying, Jesus is my Savior. And he says here, examine yourself. Examine yourself and then and only then when you have identified your sin and confessed your sin and perhaps apologized to people. I remember when a few of the men here left the congregation on Sunday morning to go to apologize to an old man who was home and couldn't come to church anymore. He had been offended because we bought him chicken to eat. And he wasn't supposed to have chicken. Well, we didn't know that. So we went and talked to him and apologized to him, but he offered no uh, forgiveness. He held that against us, never came back to church again. But do you see that we offended a person and there were people here who packed up and went to straighten that out before we went on with things. Let a man examine himself and so... Let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You ever been in a position where you said, I have got to go and see so-and-so and and apologize to them or find out what's wrong with our relationship. What have I done to make you stand at a distance from me? Examine yourself and see if there's some cleanup that needs to be done in your life. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. What does that mean? If I look in the mirror and say, you're a fine guy, I I wish the whole world was like you. I'm not judging the body rightly. If I look in the mirror and, and say, you know, that wasn't my fault. They hit me first. Or they were talking about me, so I have a right to be mad at them and I'm never gonna forgive them. That's not judging the body rightly. If you come to the Lord's table 
putting forth this testimony that Christ is my Savior, His blood and body were given for me, and I am doing my level best to walk with Him and to live for Him. And really in your heart and your attitude towards somebody, you are at odds with them when you know you should forgive them or seek forgiveness. Straighten it out. Straighten it out. For this reason, he says, there is discipline in your midst. The brother read about discipline. He says, what father has a child that he doesn't discipline? I have grandkids that I, I work with uh, all the time. And so does Shirley. And we have to say, no, that's, that's not the way we do things. We're, you need to go this route. And that's not how you treat your brother. You need to... Uh, uh, do differently and be kind and, and loving toward one another. There's always some correction that comes from your father. God does the same thing for us. Don't you love that? I hope you do. Without correction, where would we wind up? Back in the mire and the filth that we once lived in with joy. Let a man examine himself and then let him eat the bread. Examine yourself. You discover sin, you confess it to the Lord. He's faithful and righteous to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then you're ready to eat. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. That's, that's the Father's discipline. Sickness or a bodily infirmity is not always the discipline of the Lord, but it certainly can be. So we examine ourselves. Many in the Corinthian church refused to confess and turn from their sin and lack of love for their fellow Christians. They refused to submit to our Lord's instructions as concerns the supper. Therefore, God the Father disciplined them with sickness and even took the lives of some. Now Paul tells them and us how easy it is to avoid such discipline. Verse 31. But if we judged ourselves rightly... We should not be judged. We'll not be disciplined by God. When, but when we are judged or analyzed and found to be rebel children, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that or so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. This isn't about getting a bigger cracker. It's not about filling your belly. He's going to tell us that in a moment. If you're hungry, eat at home. Verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you may not come together for discipline. Treating one another like you've been treating each other. Don't do that. God's going to jerk a knot in your tail, as my father used to say. Didn't use my name till I was a grown man. He said, boy... I'm about to jerk a knot in your tail. And, and I knew that that was an awful thing. And whatever I was doing, I would stop it. My mother, I messed with her some, but not dad. And he says, and there's more I've got to straighten out among you. And I'll uh, do this when I come. And so the Lord's Supper is an ordinance established by Christ about which he said, do this in remembrance of my sacrifice for your sinful soul. Why does he want us to do this? There are at least two reason, reasons. One is to remind us that God has saved his people from their sin by the sacrifice of his own son who was and remains our high priest. If there is any thought that you contributed anything to your salvation, you need to get that dug out of your brain. Reject it. No, it is to remind us that salvation is of the Lord through faith in Christ, not uh, by our works or uh, half-baked obedience, but because of the perfections of Christ. Second, he wants us to learn that regular self-examination is necessary for your own spiritual health and that of the church. Met a guy uh, this last week who says, I don't believe we need to confess our sins because they're forgiven in Christ. Well, I guess you could compare that to, I don't 
think I need to take a bath because I took one yesterday. Even though I've been mucking out the, uh, the stalls in the barn. This is a, a relational thing between God and his children. When my child and was, uh, when I was at odds with one of my children and they with me, we had to work that out. There had to be apologies and, and sometimes discipline. And then we were fine again. He wants us to learn that regular self-examination is necessary for our own spiritual health and that of the church. We must ask ourselves searching question, questions such as, what is my walk like with the Lord? What is my relationship with the brethren like? Have I hurt someone with unkind actions or words? If so, have I sought their forgiveness? Having been offended, have I readily granted forgiveness as Christ has forgiven me? Are there sins in my life that I refuse to acknowledge before God and repent of? Am I trusting Christ alone for acceptance with God? Or do I trust in some imagined goodness in myself because I'm better than other people? Self-examination. That's painful, isn't it? Yeah. When we identify some pet sin we have tolerated in our lives, we need not despair. I'm glad I can say that. Is there any sin that's come to mind during this presentation? Oh, yes. To the minds of us all, I suspect. This is self-examination. Have we identified some pet sin we've tolerated in our lives? Gossip, perhaps? Uh, I, I don't know what it might be. There's a, there's a long list of possibilities. But do not despair. God has covered this. For our self-examination is carried on in light of the promise that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to for continue to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness again and again and again and again. He died once and paid for all our sins. When our sin is identified, confessed, and repented of, we are forgiven and we are invited to eat and drink in a worthy manner. Someone asked me a few weeks ago about this passage that we recite on Sundays, and so that's my answer. That's what it's all about, and it's applicable to us, isn't it? It is. Following Christ's instructions, any and every believer can come to the table and participate. Examine yourself. Take those stumblings, those sins, those whatever it is, take them to the Lord. He'll forgive you by faith in Christ. Gentlemen, would you come, please?